but we're finding that we have just touched the beginnings of the discoveries of human origins. We have probably almost doubled the number of known skeletons from the entirety of the early hominid record. This little remarkable hole in the ground had delivered to us this extraordinary wealth like no other site in history. I stand here representing one of the largest paleontological or archaeological projects in history. This project is only three years old, and yet it involves more than 80 scientists from around the world. In fact, every continent except Antarctica, and I'm looking for someone down there to, to do some research. This discovery um, was in part largely due to the organization you sit in tonight, and funny enough was due in fact in part to what was perceived at the time as a failed expedition. In 1997, 1998, 1999, I actually took a National Geographic grant to utilize a new technology, to utilize a, a technology that had been developed called handheld GPS that we had just become aware of and had just become commercially available. I bought one of the most expensive GPSs you could get that could bring you to the remarkable accuracy of 15 meters on planet Earth, or so it said on the box. I also, at that time, with a very large National Geographic grant, bought something that was absolutely remarkable. I bought digital satellite images from NASA that they had just made available. They had the ability of getting you down to 30 meter pixels on planet Earth for 10,000 US dollars a sheet. <laughs> I bought two of them. <laughs> and with those in hand, I decided to go back out and explore Southern Africa. And so I was going to GPS coordinate the fossil sites of Southern Africa, and I was going to look for more with this remarkable satellite technology. And off I went, and over a period of three years, I concentrated my explorations around Southern Africa, but in the end, specifically around an area called the Cradle of Humankind, just outside of Johannesburg. Now, this area is one of the most explored areas on planet Earth for early human fossils. It was the first area explored in Africa uh, in, from 1935 onward. Luminaries like Dart and Broom and even Frank Peabody was out there, Philip Tobias, Bob Rain, everybody in our field has explored this dolomitic region and rightfully so, it's become one of the richest sources of human ancestor fossils. And we knew it very well. At the time I began that exploration project, we knew of about 100 cave sites and about 16 fossil bearing sites in the area. And we pretty much thought we had it figured out. By the end of that three year period, I had found four new fossil sites and about 25 or 30 new cave sites that no scientist had put a pin on. And I thought that was remarkable. So did my colleagues. And so over the next decade or so, I began to dig with colleagues some of those new sites, and we found remarkably little in those sites. The objects that we're after, I have to remind you, these early human ancestor fossils are probably some of the rarest sought after objects on planet Earth. I sit in a field that is probably populated by more scientists than the fossils they study. I sit in a field that, for the vast majority of people, who call themselves paleoanthropologists or physical anthropologists who work on early humans, they will go through their entire careers and never find a single piece of one of these in the wild. So it's an extraordinary difficult field and the perceived rarity of these things makes even tiny fragments valuable. I found myself in December of 2007 as the last single human being on planet Earth to discover Google Earth. <laughs> and in doing that, I was staggered. There I was sitting at home over our summer vacation in South Africa, and I did what every single one of you did when you found Google Earth before that date. Remember what you did? You looked at your own home, right, to see if you're lying naked by the swimming pool. I wasn't. And then the second thing you do is you start looking at places that are familiar to you. And somewhere along that journey, you find that when you type in a longitude and latitude or a GPS coordinate, it flies in in that really cool way that Google Earth does. And I had these very expensive, hardly 
explored numbers from the late 1990 expedition. And I eagerly typed the first one in, and it zoomed into nothing. I typed the second one in, it was wrong, and on and on. I didn't have the caves mapped. It didn't take me long to Google. Why? Because in the late 1990s, the United States government owned those GPS satellites. And they had put in deliberate error so that they couldn't be used for military purposes and other things. And with my highly accurate 15 meter resolution combined with that deliberate error, my numbers were all wrong. 50 meters, 150, 250 meters off. It was a disaster. But I could play move the dots because on Google Earth, they had a five meter resolution in the cradle of humankind area. And I could move those dots onto the cave sites. I could see the cave site I intended to map. And so over January and into February, I spent my time moving all these dots onto the right place. And as I did that, I began to see patterns in distribution. I began to see lines. I saw areas where I thought the fossil sites were in deliberate association. And then I began to see what I thought were other caves. If that's a cave, this is a cave. I knew there weren't because I'd explored this area. Everybody's explored this area. But in March of 2008, it so intrigued me, I took my laptop out and a 3G card so I could get onto Google Earth, and I printed out a target area onto an A4 page with little dots mapped of what I thought looked like caves. And I went as far away from where I'd spent the last 17 years working, this site of Gladysville, in the middle of this area because I knew that area better than anyone. I knew there was nothing there. I started in the city limits of Krugersdorp, and on the first day out, I found 21 new fossil sites. By July, I had found over 600 previously unidentified cave sites and 40 previously unidentified fossil sites. Literally, we went from, say, 20 fossil sites to 60 in a matter of a couple months. On the 1st of August, I dropped a colleague of mine, Paul Dirks, off at a series of caves right in the middle of the property that the site of Gladys Vale is on, right next to where I'd spent the last 17 years to map that cave. And my dog Tao and I drove down a road that's coming up in a valley that you'll see in just a moment into an area where I knew I was not going to find anything. And the reason I knew I wasn't going to find anything is because I had found one of those four fossil sites in this valley in that very expensive National Geographic expedition. I had been there before, but I saw these little blips, those little clusters of trees being marked, and they looked like targets to me. And in particular, that little cluster of greenish dots you see there looked like what caves should look like. And so, Tao and I stopped the car on that dirt road right next to that red star, 50 meters from the road, and I immediately saw a lime trackway. What a lime trackway is is little tiny strip of cleared area. I had been on that road maybe 300 times in the last 17 years, and I'd never seen that track. And when I saw it, I knew I was about to make a discovery. Because the miners who had mined these limestone caves to get lime to build Johannesburg in the late 19th and early 20th century would build those trackways leading up to fossil bearing cave sites. And so Tao and I walked up that road. We came to an old game fence, which you can see it running right in here, but the property was being expanded and it was deteriorating and animals had broken through in just the right place so that we could slip through this game fence. And we walked into this, and I was staggered. Because I knew as soon as I approached what you're looking at right there, this cluster of trees, that there was a cave site there. Those trees grow in the disturbed area of these denuded trees, white stinkwoods, wild olives. It's the signal marker. When I walked into that, I was truly staggered, and this next slide, don't gasp. Yes, I know, it's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> There was a little hole in the ground, 
two and a half meters wide, two meters deep. And that is highly unusual. That cluster of trees you saw was probably about 30 meters long and about 25 meters wide. That would be the extent of the cave, and the miners knew that. And when they found sites, as they had found this one, they would put blasts in, and they had done that here using dynamite. They put three blasts in here, and they blew up a couple of dozen rocks onto the surface, and then they had left this site. I had almost never seen a cave that miners had bothered to blast and leave. And they'd left this one. Well, I was on a mapping expedition, so I took some notes, and the very first rock I turned over had an antelope humerus in it, a huge bone of an antelope sitting right on the surface. I was one kilometer from where I've spent the last 17 years digging, a hill and a half away, and I had never seen this site. No scientist had been there. No scientist had ever marked it. And when we scientists find a site like this, we leave tells. We pile up little rocks. And you can tell we've been there. No one had been there, despite this area probably being outside of the Sturkfontein Valley, the most explored area within the most explored area on planet Earth for early hominids. I it would stun me. But I was on an exploration mission. So I took accurate GPS coordinates and this very bad photo. And I walked up the hill and found 46 previously unidentified caves, 46, right next to where I'd spent almost the last two decades. That surprised me. <laughs> I went back to the lab, and something I didn't tell you, something terrible had happened the week before this. A young man who was going to come over and take over the directorship of our institute and transform us into this modern technological lab to create this new generation had been killed in a motorcycle accident. And we'd already hired staff and everything to work under that. And one of them was a young man named Joe Kibbe, a Kenyan postdoctoral student. And he came into my office three or four days later and said, Lee, would you take over my postdoctoral supervision? And I said, no. You're a lab guy. I'm not a lab guy. I can't teach you this stuff, but I've just found this site. And if you're willing to learn to be a field guy, I'll take you out there and let's see what this thing has, because it is bugging me. So on the 15th of August, Joe, myself, my dog Tal, and my nine-year-old son Matthew went back to this site to see what it had to offer. And we walked up that little lime trackway through the fence, got to the edge of this pit, and I was telling them the story of that, how I had discovered the site. And we got to the edge, and I said, OK, go find fossils. If you find anything, call me. I'll identify it. Let's see what this place has to offer. And with that, Matthew and Tao are gone, off the site into the high grass. I think they're going to go chase giraffe or something, and I'll see them at lunchtime. And I was standing next to Job saying, you know, I think they left this alone because they probably did what I did. They found the site first. And then as they started drilling these holes for the dynamite, the foreman probably walked up the hill, found all these easy to get caves, and they had then gone and destroyed every one of those 46 caves. And as I said that, Matthew said, Dad, I found a fossil. And I almost didn't go look, because I knew what he had found. He'd found an antelope fossil, because that's all we bloody well ever find. For every single early hominid we find, we find about 250,000 antelope fossils. <laughs> but he's my nine-year-old son, and just like all of you, you have to encourage fossil hunting. So I started walking towards him, and five meters away from him, I saw this. And I knew that both his and my life were going to change forever. And instead of me telling you this story, let me actually let an expert tell you actually what happened. I'm Matthew Berger, I'm 12 years old, and this is the lightning struck tree where I found one of the coolest things in the world. What happened was my dad had found this site two weeks before, and he had said that he had found some antelope fossils at it, so he wanted to take me out to see if I could find anything. So two weeks later, we came out with myself, my dog Tao, and his colleague Job Kibbe. And we came to the site and he said, go look for fossils. So I ran off down a path 
trying to f- trying to catch my dog Tao, and and I, and as I was running, I tripped over a log in the middle of the path, and as I was tripping, I saw a fossil sticking out of a rock right next to this tree, and when I got up to dust all the dirt off myself, I picked up the rock, and there was the clavicle of a hominid sticking out. But at first, I didn't know it was a clavicle. I thought it was an antelope fossil, so I called my dad over, and about five meters away, he started swearing, and I was like what did I do? And he's like, nothing, nothing. You found a hominid. And I was pretty shocked, but I wasn't as shocked as I would be when it actually got released because I never knew it was going to be that big. I just thought it was going to be just another fossil find. (laughs) (laughs) What was sticking out of the edge of that rock? was this remarkable bone. And how I knew it was a clavicle from five meters away, although I doubt the veracity of the cursing that Matthew mentioned, (laughs) is that very few animals have clavicles in Africa. Bats have them, this was too big because bats fly. Moles have them because they dig, this was too big. And primates have them. And amongst primates, the only one with an S-shaped or sigmoid-shaped clavicle are hominids. And I happen to be one of the only world's experts on hominid clavicles. I did my PhD on them. (laughs) All sort of six or seven partial fragments that have ever been discovered. I did my PhD on the clavicle, the proximal humerus, and the scapula, of which there had never been a complete one of any of those bones ever found. In fact, there had never been, for two of those bones, anything but fragments, and I was looking at one. And I did what anyone would do. I didn't believe it. I looked at it. And as I turned it over to get it in better light, thinking this has got to be something else, sitting on the back was sticking out the jaw and canine of a hominid, as well as other bones indicating the upper part of a skeleton was sitting in that tiny block. Remember how rare I told you these things were. There may be 3,000 or so that have ever been discovered. The vast majority of hominid fossils we discover are isolated teeth, something in excess of 90%. For almost every bone below the neck, except for maybe a couple finger bones and some of the denser bones, we have never found a complete bone in any early hominid. Everything's fragmentary. For really rare things, those things like mandibles and skulls that bless the pages of National Geographic occasionally, there are literally only a few dozen that have ever been found anywhere in Africa. And when you get to the truly rare things, what we paleoanthropologists generously call partial skeletons, and that means any single piece of the cranial remains, teeth or head, associated with any single piece of the body of one individual, there had at that time been about seven or so found, of which probably about four or five you would know the names of, Lucy, Littlefoot, Turkana, Boy, Jakika, Child. Then they start getting really scrappy after that. And I was probably holding one. And I was stunned, because what are the odds that a jaw and a clavicle and these upper limb elements I could see sticking out were not one individual? I actually called the South African Heritage Resource Agency, because of course there's cell phone coverage at the site, and got permission to take that rock out. But now, of course, we could not touch the site. It becomes under an entirely different permitting structure. And that's frustrating. I take that rock back, and we begin preparing it out. And within a couple of days, we realize that, yes, indeed, there was a partial skeleton inside of that rock. There was a jaw coming out of a child. The M3 was not erupted, but the M2 was. There were these upper limb bones, and the growth centers were not fused, as would befit a teenage child. And it was in clear association, even from the first minute. And there was much rejoicing at our institute. On September 3rd, I was told that I would receive the permit. And back out, we went to the site on September 4th. Everybody who was a paleoanthropologist, a physical anthropologist, an archaeologist, a biological anthropologist, or who liked dogs, <laughs> went back out to that site from Vitz, 14 of us professionals, because we don't find these things, as I told you. And everyone in our group, I think, was thinking, if a nine-year-old can do it in a minute and a half. <laughs> 
We got back out to the site early in the morning, and three and a half hours later, we had not found a single piece that you could identify as an early hominid. In this tiny little hole, with that little block coming from right back there, we couldn't even connect the dots, and we were devastated. We couldn't find a single thing that you would positively identify as a probable early human. And like all good South Africans do in moments of tragedy, we broke for tea. <laughs> and everyone went over and sat just to the left of this picture. And I walked back to this pit, a pit that we had all been in and out of trying to fit that block back in and exploring countless times. And I was standing there trying to visualize that moment, maybe 100 years ago, a blast just gone off. They, Miners go down, they start throwing rocks out. How would a rock get from here to there? And I began to have that ugly feeling that maybe that rock hadn't come from here. Maybe it'd come from one of those other 46 caves that had been destroyed and we would never know its context. And I was trying to visualize those miners and see them. And as I did, the sun had got up just enough to light the back of this wall. And I saw sticking out of the wall, the proximal humerus of a hominid two and a half centimeters out of the rock. Remember, I'm one of the world's experts on them. I know what they look like. I didn't say anything, though. I climbed down into the hole. As I got within about a meter and a half of it, I realized to my astonishment that attached to the humerus was a scapula. Remember, I did my PhD on them. <laughs> and I knew that I had found the skeleton. Mandible, clavicle, proximal humor, scapula, it's got to be this child. I still didn't say anything, though. I put my hand on the rock, and two hominid teeth fell out of the dirt on the surface into my hand. And then I said something. <laughs> and everyone came down in, and we were astonished. And I said, be careful. These things are falling out of the wall. And as I said that, an archaeologist reached down to lift a rock. And I said, stop, because sticking out of the back of it was the proximal femur, the thigh bone, of that juvenile hominid. I couldn't believe it. It would be something that never crossed my mind, I promise you, yet it should have, when I was holding those two worn teeth, that this was not that child's skeleton. This was a second skeleton, because never in history had two skeletons been found together in an early hominid deposit. It would take another month and a half, and us taking that block out, this, this large block right here out, and beginning to prepare it, and within minutes, I then knew that we indeed did have a second skeleton, because it was an adult. Its epiphyses refused. We would later find the little child right above there, just a few centimeters above what would turn out to be a female skeleton. This little remarkable hole in the ground had delivered to us this extraordinary wealth in the last three years, like no other site in history. Not only has it yielded the two most complete early hominid skeletons ever discovered, without excavating, it's also yielded other individuals. Last April, we announced a new species of early hominid from this site. Australopithecus sediba means fountain or wellspring in the Sutu language. And of course, my colleagues always force me to show this image because it was, of course, on the cover of the journal Science. And for scientists, that's like maybe a rock star being on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. And so we're very proud of that. Three weeks ago, we were again on the cover of Science announcing new morphologies and interpretations and things like this, which I'll talk about in a moment. We were talking about the remarkable, remarkable morphology, unexpected morphology of Australopithecus sediba. It is not what we had predicted. It has these long ape-like arms. Here is the arm of a chimpanzee. This is the female's arm. And by the way, every one of those bones is the only complete undamaged bone of its kind ever found in the entirety of the early hominid record, the radius, the ulna, and the humerus. That is a human, a pygmy of approximately the same size. You can see how odd those arms are. And when we saw that, we said, it must be a climber. 
and we predicted what the hand would look like. It must be long and curved with a shortened thumb just like all the early Australopithecines are. And it was not. It was human-like. It's the most human-like hand that has ever been discovered in the early hominid record. It has a long thumb, like a human, in fact, almost superhuman. It's got shortened fingers, and it lacks curvature in those fingers. It is more advanced than the Homo habilis hand, for which handyman and the first ancient member of the genus Homo was named, which just happens to be about 300,000 years younger than this. It should not be on the end of that ape-like arm, but there it is. If we'd found it separately, we wouldn't have put those two things together. That hand is almost iconic. This is Archbishop Desmond Tutu, for those of you who don't recognize, holding that remarkable thing. And it is a clear identifier of a unique aspect of human morphology, something that is only really found in Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, and we presume in Homo erectus, although we've never found a hand in those. Just three weeks ago, we began publishing more. This is what those skeletons look like in April of last year. And they may look pretty scrappy to you, but they both individually, even at that stage, were the most complete early hominid skeletons ever found. They were more complete than Lucy. This is what they look like now. They are works in progress. There is absolutely no reason to suspect that we will not find these skeletons in their entirety. We have not explored this planet. We have not understood what we were walking on. We must take the technology of the 21st century. We must take this lethargy of the idea that we have found all the cool stuff, and we must prepare everyone in this world for discovery. We must teach the children that there's more out there, because there is. <laughs>